fighting all of you now. As the most experienced fighter around, I'll be waiting there for all of you. Waiting to crush you, I will finally be the ultimate champion. The undefeated of the East, West, South, North, and Center. I will become Super Asia and be champion of all. <laughs> uh, out. Hey, welcome to another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Jake. This week we've got an interview with Johnny Christmas. He is uh, his uh, new book, Firebug, out in comic book stores everywhere and on Comixology on Wednesday, March 7th. Chronicles this, uh, it, it was originally in the pages of uh, Island Magazine, and here it is, stands collected as, as an original graphic novel, this Polynesian society that worships a fire deity, and what it means to a certain group of young people as it kind of turns its attention towards them. But you know what? Let's let Johnny talk about it. And joining us this week, we have Johnny Christmas, his book, uh, Firebug, an original graphic novel, originally first seen in the pages of Island Magazine. Is out in comic book stores everywhere and on Comixology on Wednesday, March 7th. Uh, Johnny also co-created Angel Catbird with Margaret Atwood of Handmaiden's Tale fame. Johnny, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. So, you know, with, with Angel Catbird, you've got this kind of like more European sensibility. I mean, you've got a, a character named Catkilla who's very kind of like Hammer Studios uh, vampire. With, here on Firebird... You're or Firebug. You're you're really kind of pulling a uh, a lot of Polynesian influence, a lot of kind of tropic stuff with their kind of like you know ele- more elemental gods, and of course the locale. Where did this? Let's start with the macro question. Where did the story, this inspiration, kind of come from? Uh, well, it started as kind of a game of what if. I started uh, thinking about what if I lived at the uh, the foot of a volcano and the volcano could go at any moment. What kind of culture would grow out of that sort of um situation like every day could be your last so do you live it to the fullest or do you live it with a sense of dread so i just i decided that that the civilization that lived it to the fullest would be a certain kind of uh, civilization that worshipped um the goddess in a bid to sort of placate it so uh so yeah so once i once i started there i started looking into yeah polynesian um, mythology, and that led me into other sort of mythologies, creation, destruction mythologies from all around the world, and then it just sort of took off and became its own thing. Hmm. Well, if there if there's kind of like some running themes throughout throughout Firebug, it's the idea of both like legacy, the idea of there there's like almost like a destiny or cyclical nature to to everything, life, death, rebirth. Uh, were were those kind of what what was it that really kind of drew you to to kind of to tell those kind of stories? Um, I'm not sure. It just sort of took off once you once I had the characters in place. Mm-hmm. They just sort of started telling me kind of what they would do if, from their point of view, and those certain dilemmas. Yeah. Say you you know been a deity and it was just a theory, and then it actually the deity shows up and it was like actually your homie. Like what is <laughs> what is that? To your headspace, and what if you know uh, you don't believe in a deity, and then feel, and it, you know, like uh, so then you just sort of start true to characters and true to their scenarios. Um, yeah, I, I wish I could say I was like, oh yeah, I was gonna, it was gonna be like this, and it's gonna be like that. A lot of it is just kind of a uh, waiting and letting, and just kind of writing long and letting the characters tell you where they would go and from that point you just sort of um fit scenario that would make it that gets the most juice out of it um but starting with the characters always first you know something that i kind of noticed with this we're used to in in modern fiction we're used to uh to our kind of deity figures being these um infallible or unrelatable kind of like these characters on the hill, and you, you were mentioning, what if deities were your homies? These are like the most humanistic, like, and and to that degree, just like humans, flawed deities that we've and demigods that we've ever seen. Yet you don't compromise on the their destructive or their just their awesome potential, which I thought was re- a really cool uh, balance because we don't really see that anymore. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that was um, kind of my guiding principle. I wanted uh, no matter 
which point of view you're looking from, any character, even the villains, that if looked at from a certain point of view, they could be the heroes of the story. Mm. That, like, everyone is aggrieved, everyone is celebrating, everyone has uh, something that they want. And I didn't want, like, my hero to be completely perfect, because that's boring. And I didn't want my villains to be just, like, you know, twirling mustaches and just out to destroy everything all the time. Like, they they have a reason for wanting to do certain things that we may see as destructive, but to them, it's actually for the good. Um, so yeah, so thanks a lot. I really wanted that to come through. What was it? I mean, wh- I think the, the natural antagonist to, to fire is, is water. So was it always kind of like you had mentioned you had kind of gotten the idea, like what if I lived at the foot of a volcano and everything was it, I mean, I, I think there's there's so many, now that I'm like kind of like sitting here thinking about it, there's so many different dynamics. And I think w- one, one of the big questions I've got at the, at the crux of it all, you've got this, you've got this relationship between Keegan and, and Griffin. So even in the face of this awesome power of these, of fire and water dueling for control across the, you know, across this island, there's this love story at the center of it all. Was that always just trying to keep the characters grounded was that trying to remind the you know the state the more like relatable stakes to to the story and to the characters? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, it was kind of uh, like that was the main focus for a lot of them. Like, uh, kind of like how you go to your job every day, you have your stuff that you need to do, you pay your bills, you blah blah blah. But the thing that's really driving you at the back of your mind, even if you aren't talking about it all the time, is a lot of times. Um, your romantic situations, the people who you care about, like all that stuff you may not talk about all the time and it may not be um, front of conversation, but it's always front of mind. So I kind of wanted that where they go off on all this, you know, there's like dueling and fighting and adventures and stuff. But as soon as the object of one's affection reappears, it's like everything stops. Like, okay, all right, well, never mind this, never mind that. Like my love is here. So, uh, so I really thought that was really important that the characters would act that way. Like it would kind of stop everything to just sort of pursue that, especially if uh, the one one loves is estranged, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Kind of makes everything a lot more relatable. Now, to kind of go a little behind the scenes, you know, this, this story was originally serialized in, in the island, like I was uh, I, I mentioned a, a bit earlier. With Angel Catbird, you've kind of got the graphic novel format. Do you prefer the more longer form storytelling, or do you prefer a more kind of serialized, uh, you know, chapter by chapter, uh, you know, storytelling? I like the the longer form because you can sort of, you, you could see everything kind of uh, all at once. You can kind of like play it all out really long. However, I do like the satisfaction of just getting chunks out. Um, just like dropping, you know, 20, 22 page issues and knowing that you have a nice, satisfying uh, story, you know, chunk. And it's so much easier to edit and so much easier to uh, mm-hmm. to work with from that point of view. And it's faster. So that's so it's much more satisfying to work on single issues, but it's much um, more rewarding to work on a larger, longer form yeah. project. Yeah. A lot, a lot less intimidating when you're working on it chapter by chapter. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, because then because it, it could be kind of messy, and you're like, ah, you know, we had a month. This is the best <laughs> we had. So it's a like a uh, like a uh, live concert. You know, like playing playing jazz before a bunch of people straight away, and just like, hey, it was kind of sloppy, but it had a lot of soul. Sure. Uh, versus being in the studio crafting an album for two years or something. Right. 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 So, can't all be Sergeant Peppers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you know, Magical Mystery Tour is good enough. But the, <laughs> um, I you enjoy know, that album. <laughs> you know, okay. We're all about the tangents and rabbit you know, holes on this show. Oh, yeah. Now, everybody forgets Magical Mystery Tour has got like Strawberry Fields Forever, All You Need Is Love, yep. Penny Lane. Yeah. That yeah. album doesn't get, and everyone's just like, "Well, it's not Sergeant Blue Pepper. Jay Way." <laughs> well, okay, well, we can. All right, flying. <laughs> I like flying. Yeah, flying, flying is flying. actually kind of fun. Flying's eerie. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. Blue Jay weighs like eerie. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, flying's like the you know, well, you know yeah, flying. Yeah, flying's kind of like this like. like no, 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 yeah, no, no. Groovy uh, <laughs> jam. Yeah, the only yeah. instrumental track the Beatles ever did, unless you count Carnival of Light, mm. which we you know, it's a, yeah. <laughs> Did, did, what do you, what do you listen to? Because this is always something that intrigues me. Like, what do, what do you listen to or or have on in the background when you're when you're drawing, Johnny? Uh, so if I'm if I'm penciling, sometimes I listen to podcasts or audio books. Uh, if I'm uh, if I'm inking, then I listen to a lot of music, and then it just it goes all over the place. Like today, I was listening to a lot of um, like. Roots reggae and a lot of uh, cranberries because you know, of course, yeah, uh, Dolores or Jordan just passed away, which is heartbreaking. Um, a lot of Bell and Sebastian today. Let me see what's on my Spotify queue. What mm. was I what was I listening to? Uh, <laughs> it's Bell, like, yeah, Bell trying and Sebastian, to reconstruct man. the crime. Yeah. Color my uh, life with uh, the chaos of trouble. That's my favorite. So, uh, that's my favorite Bell and Sebastian line. Color my life with the chaos of trouble. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love the um, another sunny day. The um, oh, yeah. pick eleven for football. Uh, tell the referee to fuck off. I forget <laughs> how that, I'm. I'm gonna botch the line, but anyway, it's just it's really kind of yeah. Yeah. I can't think. I can't think of it, but it's a wonderful song. I mean, the spirit of it's there. But while while you're kind of like fishing through uh, the uh, the playlist, you know, you work with Tamara Bonvillain on both this and and uh, and um, Angel Catbird. What is it about? You know, what what do you think she how uh, it is about her abilities as a colorist that gives your your uh, art that extra oomph. Uh, she's, I think we've like gotten into a nice groove, working, which is um, which is really a wonderful gift. And besides, she's just a very intuitive colorist. So a lot of times, I don't have to tell her to do this or do that or make it this way. Like I just, the the longer we work together, the the less I actually give her in terms of notes. Um, so it's just a wonderful, uh, collaboration. I don't know how to put it. It's just, it, it makes a lot of sense, you know, uh, it's hard to put it in, into words, but, but when you're, when you're artistically and you sort of, a lot of stuff is in your head and it's, uh, it would take forever to write it all out, like exactly what you want for a, a lot of things. And half the time when I send things off to Tamara, they are either exactly what I intended or bad. You know, a lot of times I'm like, oh, I didn't even think about that. But that's a lot better than what I would have actually thought of doing. So, yeah, she's wonderful. She's an amazing thing to have. Well, to kind of, I mean, I guess the best way I can think to put it, to continue the Beatles discussion, because we're always... Mm going to talk Beatles. <laughs> we used to do, you know, we do side podcasts. <laughs> like we have our own like little special series. Jake and I went through and analyzed track by track every single Beatles album, like backwards and forwards. Um, but I think to kind of speak to what that. Were findings? Uh, what was our findings? We, we love them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were pretty good. <laughs> uh, your findings were that uh, a YouTube commenter knows more than you about the Beatles. <laughs> That's also true. <laughs> yeah, pretty pretty good band. Yeah, <laughs> come at me, bros. <laughs> but the uh, don't come at me. But the um, you know, to kind of speak to that art- spirit of artistic collaboration, you guys complement each other, so you are greater than the sum of your parts. There is kind of like this like kindred spirit w- while you're working towards the same goal. Yeah, yeah, I'd say that's fair. So I mean that that's got to be that's got to be pretty cool. But you know I'd be remiss. Speaking of collaborations, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least ask, how has it been? You know, Handmaiden's Tale being like the, probably the biggest show Hulu's got, and just you know Margaret being kind of the the badass that she is. How has it been working on Angel Catbird with her? Uh, that's been great. She's uh, really um. Uh, as a creative person, you don't get a lot of opportunities to to work with someone who's had a creative life for you know half a century. Oh, yeah. So it's um, so a lot of times I find myself just observing her, <laughs> just seeing like, oh, this is what it looks like when you've had like a creative life for that long and a really successful one, and a, like not just like you know successful in terms of you know um, uh, 
uh, acclaim, but it, uh, in terms of art, like really wonderful art, art just mining all this great stuff and all the research that goes into it and the professionalism that she displays every time she does an interview or, or, or an appearance. Amazing. Uh, yeah, it, it's been, it's been uh, an education. Well, okay. To kind of continue that thread, you know, and you're uh, you're doing the writing duties on on Firebug as well. What kind of lessons did you kind of glean in terms of your craftsmanship in in creating this story, or just creating stories moving forward? Uh, from my collaboration with Margaret, or just in general, but certainly from your collaboration with Margaret. Uh, not so much in terms of um, art and story, but just in terms of. Uh, the business end, really, and, and how to conduct oneself in um, every setting, like uh, to take everything seriously and to take everything, um, approach everything um, with with the sense of sort of purpose instead of kind of like, oh, yeah, this doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. Um, I'm just doing a billion of these or it doesn't really matter. Like it all matters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, just I think that's what I, I learned the most. And that's what I'm trying to carry over into everything I do. Sure. To to look at the the long tail and try and um try and aim for a longevity and by you know sweating the small stuff to hopefully get to the long um the long stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Playing, playing the long, like focusing on details as you play the long, or keep your eye on the long game. Absolutely. So to take it back to to Firebug, one of the most striking things visually is you. I mean, just just like you know, I mentioned Angel Catbird with Catkilla, who I think is just just the name Catkilla is enough to hopefully get everyone <laughs> scurrying for their for their Googles and mm -hmm. to search <laughs> search that awesome beast. But, you know, with, with Firebug, you lean even more into creature design. You've got, like, the big hulking things. You've got the, the elemental deities. You've got these kind of, like, uh, even just, like, the, the architecture reflecting, like, cults and that sort of thing and different, and different tribes and, and, and that aspect. What were some of your more visual influences when you were kind of crafting these, you know, these, these kind of mind-bending things? Uh, in terms of, uh, monsters, I don't know, it's just like, uh, start doodling, you know, as an artist, you just doodle and doodle and, and you come up with what's the funnest thing to draw. And then, um, and that's kind of where my monsters for Firebug came from. I didn't really reference them from sort of anything. So it was just pure joy coming up with them. <laughs> um, I like, I had so many, there was some that I was trying to get in but they, they just wouldn't work from a story point of view mm. and there was this one this entire scene with these entire other monsters that i have like like hell or high water i was going to get them in and then uh, as I, I even drew most of the scene and then as i looked at it I just oh this is just such a shoehorn this is just going to slow down everything but um that's how much fun i was having with the monsters on this thing yeah it was great it's kind of got it i mean you know, I always kind of whenever I'm talking to like writer artists, there there's always like this like one image that kind of they can't get out of their head. They're like, this is what's this is what the story's going to be. You know, it, yeah. And you know, you had mentioned the idea of like living in the volcano or living at the foot of a volcano. What is the one image as you were crafting Firebug and just writing it or just drawing it or doodling it that you were just like that you just kept coming back to? Was it was it that volcano? Yeah, it was uh, people sort of celebrate, celebrating at the foot of this, like, erupting volcano. That was kind of was um, in my head. So a lot of times, a lot of these ideas that you think the story is going to be about are just kind of uh, turn out to just be starting points. So they don't actually even, they're not even in the story. So a, a lot of the story I thought was going to be a, a, around the culture of this you know, it might seem like a death culture, or but to some like a life culture, like live in the moment because it could all blow to blow up yeah. tomorrow, kind of thing. But as the narrative sort of kept going, and I started falling into the characters, then I started following them and left the concept and went into the characters. 
So, so yeah, so that was the, that was the, the North star in terms of concept. And then it became something entirely different, all these monsters and, and, um, you know, this concept of these people and this volcano became all this other stuff that I think is, it's better for it. Well, it's much because more, yeah. the way it was in, yeah, the way it was in my head was a poem and the way it is written is a book. So, yeah. yeah. Well, well, it's, it's also, I mean, you know, I was mentioning the love story and everything, but I think the idea of having it just be kind of like a celebration of life in the face of potential destruction, I think you've also made it a much more emotionally complex and rich story because I mean, not everybody's celebrating, you know, I don't want, I don't want to give too much away, but like there are multiple forces, multiple motives and, you know, the, the characters in this book are on an unstoppable collision course. So, I mean, you definitely have added those shades of gray and that moral complexity to what started out as just kind of like, you know, tropical burning man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that as brilliant tropical burning man. What's firebug like Ah, tropical burning man. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I really wanted to have a lot of uh, character complexity and a lot of ins and outs. And um, I wanted every moment to be a moment on the road where you never come back to the characters at the same emotional place ever. Like they're always developing or something's always uh, coming to um, their consciousness that pushes them in a different direction. Now, you know, we've had Brandon, Brandon Graham, who, uh, you know, oversaw Island on the, uh, on the show before. Was that something, was Firebug, you know, just to kind of get into the more logistical side of everything, was that something that you would pitch to him, or did he approach you and just kind of be like, hey, man, you got anything? I'm throwing this anthology magazine together. Yeah, yeah, he approached me and said basically that. And he was like, do you have anything you want to do? So I, um, I pitched him Firebug. And then, uh, which was for Island was going to be a whole lot more sort of meditative and poetic because it was going to be three chapters and it was going to, um, have a, it was going to be totally different than what it ended up as uh, in the graphic novel. Um, so Firebug was one. And then like halfway through sort of sketching out Firebug, I, I switched over to this like kaiju thing <laughs> where it's going to have like, you know, giant robots and, you know, you know, monsters and shit. Sure. And then, uh, then Brandon was just like, hey, you should do that volcano thing. Uh, I think that was a better one. I was like, ah, I think you're right. So I went back to Firebug uh, then. But that was that was kind of the most of his sort of um, guidance on it. But for the most part, he was he was really good about just kind of hanging back in and just encouraging, very encouraging of everything we wanted to do with Island. You know, you, you invoked Kaiju, and I feel like every time somebody brings up Kaiju... I'm like contractually obligated to ask this. <laughs> who who is your favorite of the kaiju? Uh Godzilla. King of the Monsters, good, good. <laughs> uh I mean, can't go. I mean, you know, he's so... I mean, yeah, he's I mean, there's a reason. Like he's yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm that. yeah. I mean, hey, I like I like that. I like uh, I like incarnations of him too, like First, it was just like this elemental radiation mistake. It was kind of this natural disaster kind of thing in the form of a monster. And then he became misunderstood. And then he was like everybody's friend. And then, like, you know, I, I like that he's, you know, I like the justifications for like, oh, no, actually, he's not so bad after all. You know, I like all the Godzillas, actually. The, um, my personal favorite, I think I've said this on the show, I think I've told like Jim Zub or something, but the, um, my favorite, my favorite kaiju is, uh, King Caesar from Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla because he just kind of, no, I don't know that one. He's King like, Caesar? King Caesar, he's like a dog man uh, that like sleeps in a volcano, so I guess we're continuing the, <laughs> the but, uh, he, uh, he gets woken up to fight. Uh, you know, he sleeps for centuries, gets woken up, gets his ass kicked, and uh, goes goes back in the goes back in the mountain. So, really, a metaphor for for my life. But the <laughs> <laughs> Where, whereas my favorite kaiju, oddly enough, is Mecha Godzilla. So, you know, same movie. Oh. <laughs> nice. I, oh. I think one of the ones that beats him up. Oh, it's the yeah. He yeah. just like beats the sh- it's, Man, yeah. It's... Met- metaphor for my life. Then, yeah. Too. yeah. <laughs> Jake, you got a favorite kaiju? Uh, um, no. 
<laughs> no, I like um, I like uh, I like Ultraman, which uh, you know, just oh, yeah. he's the guy that kicks all their asses. Yes, technically that's a kaiju, right? Yeah. He's a kaiju. Jet Jaguar. Yeah, Jet, 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 Jet Jaguar. Uh, no, I always like the Ultraman stuff. He he's got such a great look, and uh, he's you know the guy that kicks all their asses, throws them into cardboard buildings. So <laughs> that's what we need more Ultraman. <laughs> You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, Johnny, something we ask everybody that comes on the show. What are you currently geeking out over, man? Uh, what am I currently geeking out over? Um, hmm. Hmm. Uh, do I have to be excited about it? <laughs> Is it going to be a mild geek out? It can be, and it doesn't have to be comics either, but yeah, it can be, like, we had one dude, um, Steven Sanders, <laughs> I'll just I'll just name drop that dude, uh, that uh, creates, uh, he crafts milk plastic in his free time. I don't know how excited mm. he is about that, but that's what he does. Uh, right on, all right. <laughs> um, uh, the new season of Black Mirror, let's go with that. Choice, good choice. Well, the uh, what's that first episode with like Kristen Milioti and uh, Jesse Plemons? The, uh, oh yeah, that was awesome. The uh, Star Wars takeoff, Star Trek takeoff. Excuse me, apologies. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that that's suddenly a... we lost the call. That's definitely. You guys want to talk Star Wars? <laughs> I, we can talk Star oh, Wars. Yeah, yeah, Last Jedi for oh, sure. We can talk Star Trek. We can talk both. We, you know, the but did you? Okay, we're a mixed household here. Yeah, we can. Yeah, <laughs> we can. Yeah, we can. We can cross through both worlds. Okay, you have, you have opened the the pan, the box of Pandora, Johnny. What did we you? We don't have. I was just trying to get myself out of something, but we <laughs> can. <laughs> what did you think of the Last Jedi? I thought it was a movie. And I, and I don't know why everybody's so upset about it. It was like, oh, that was an entertaining movie. Like, they had to make choices. So they did. And it was fine. Everything was just fine. You know? It wasn't, doesn't take away anything from the other ones. It just was a choice. Which I, um, I give them points on because, you know, Force Awakens was enjoyable. But, you know, there weren't that many choices. I mean, there were you know, spoilers, you know, it was a really big choice that they, they made in it, but a lot of it felt very, I don't want to use the word regurgitated because it has a negative connotation, but it it was the, there was a nostalgia that they played up that I thought was kind of, um, it was a little plain and like, oh yeah, that's very self-serving. Thank you. You know, but I like when movies take chances and, uh, and this movie took more chances and I like it. Yeah. I think that was the give it a thumbs up. Yeah, that that that's my thing about like the Last Jedi. Is it like my favorite Star Wars movie? No. Is it my least favorite Star Wars movie? Nah. But you know, it's a what I dig is that it challenges and subverts a lot of expectations. Some of those pay off. Some of them don't. But it's like I'm not one of those guys where like you know I, I've you know like I'm sure that you've seen like on like social media where you get dudes that are like. I liked, you know, huh, I saw The Last Jedi and like immediately you get comments like on both sides like, oh, I loved it or like, how, you know, I, you know, fucking hated it. Like, how, how could you? It's like, I wasn't, I was just saying I saw The Last Jedi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think, I yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's almost like we can't turn, I, I don't know how things are in, in, in Canada up, up in the north, but like down here, <laughs> I feel like we're still so like politicized and like oh, divided. Yeah. Well, just, it's also like, like you were saying, you get because I fell somewhere in the middle, leaning towards like not really liking it that much. But like, like you were saying, Johnny, like it didn't ruin Star Wars for me. It didn't, um, you know, shut me down for weeks. Going, hey, what is this movie? I, you know, I just didn't really like it that much, and that's fine. And there'll be a million other Star Wars movies long after we're all dead. So like, you know, they're gonna keep making them. Right. But but the thing that I that that drives me insane is like, like Sam was saying, you get the both sides where someone will be like, yeah, I really liked it. And everyone's like, it's terrible. It's the worst thing I've ever seen. How can you like this scene, this scene? And then you get the other side that's like, oh, yeah, I didn't like it that much. You know, whatever. Not my favorite Star Wars movie. And then people are like, oh, you hate it because of this. You hate it because of that. And like the idea of just liking or not liking a movie anymore seems like so foreign <laughs> because of social media, you know? Like it's just, um, yes, exactly. yeah, it's, it's kind of insane. But, you know, one thing we talked about a lot on the show with The Last Jedi is one thing, one thing I'll give it is I have never talked more um, 
about a Star Wars movie in recent memory than I have The Last Jedi. Like, it's caused, like, such great conversation with people and, like, good conversation, not, like, um, tearing people down because you didn't like it or because you loved it. Like, some really interesting conversations we've had on the show and we've had, like, off the show. I think we did one episode. We recorded a bunch of episodes in one day. And I think we just talked about it at different points. And then we were at IHOP for, like, three hours yeah. talking about different it. Different guests would come through. And, yeah. like, it was, you know, like, so that's something that, you you know, a, a huge positive, I think, for the movie. When it's done, respectively, you know, talking about the movie, like, uh, you know, the good and the bad. Because, like you said, there's both in, in The Last Jedi. Yeah, like these these movies, these new Star Trek. Uh, oh my goodness, um, these new Star Wars. Movies, <laughs> yeah, I can't help myself. Yeah. Uh, they made me like this, this is going to be weird because I, I I didn't I didn't expect this to happen either. But they made me a. Uh, I don't. I almost don't want to say it, but they made me appreciate the the last trilogy a lot better. Mm-hmm. Like the fact that um, the, you know a lot of those movies were flawed and you know they had a lot of problems, but they, there were chances, you know, the guy made a choice mm-hmm. and, you know, I didn't agree with the choices, a lot of them, but they were like, he made a choice. Like he made a, he made some bold choices as a matter of fact. And, you know, you're like, all oh, right on, like that's, that took guts, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, um, and I didn't realize it then how gutsy it was until now when I see movies that are pretty safe Yeah, that like, Oh, this dude, like he, you know, you know, love it or hate it, like he, he he made a choice and he stuck with it, and I gotta respect that. Yeah, I mean that's something you know. The the prequels are are such a interesting thing, but like, and you know, enough has been said negatively about the prequels to last a lifetime. But <laughs> something that you were saying, like I, we've said it a million times. I had an old um, theater uh, teacher in college that would use this phrase "be bold" all the time. Like any choice you made, you know, be bold, and that doesn't always mean the um, the loud choice. But it means, you know, make the, right. the choice that's bold. And part of the reason that's da- not dangerous, but it can be risky is because that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing. Um, and, right. I th- and I think that's something that The Last Jedi had that mantra, which I can respect. You know, the, you know it does kind of go, we're going to kind of do the exact opposite of everything you think is going to happen. Literally everything you've read on the Internet about potential... Uh, fan theories, none of that's going to exist because, you know, we're going to go the exact opposite direction. And, you know, even with the the prequels, like uh, Attack of the Clones, what, it was the first all digital movie, you know, and people were ready to, like, take out George Lucas because of that, you know, but that's that's bold as hell for him to to do something like that. So, yeah, I think Star Wars, I think all the Star Wars movies uh, kind of live by that mantra in a way. You know, I think Episode Seven probably was the safest because they're like, hey, we were restarting a new trilogy, we're reinventing this we need to be as safe as possible and like you said nostalgia is a hell of a drug you know that can help um wash away a lot of faults initially you know with those nostalgia goggles um but i don't know we'll see i i i I, I have no idea what to just you know i was like oh i i I don't know i take it very seriously uh taking up someone's time and if you're going to take up two and a half hours of someone's time Mm -hmm. you better give them some new content Mm -hmm. That's just me, though. You know. Well, also, like, Star Wars really turned over the reins to Ryan Johnson because I think this is the first time anyone's ever got solo writing and directing credit since George, like, George Lucas did, you know? Like, you, you, know, it, they, you know, they have their faith in, in Ryan Johnson because they must see something. You know, he's getting, he's getting that um, solo, or the, uh, you know, trilogy of his own. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to see what, Eight or what's going to happen? What the fallout will be for nine in terms of uh, story and character? And because I think going in to eight after we saw seven, we're like, oh, we have all these questions: who's raised parents? Who's Snoke? You know, this or that. And then love it or hate it, eight was kind of like doesn't matter. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and we'll see what that you know how that how that comes about. But um, really, I mean, we're going into some serious uncharted territory with uh, with nine. You know. Yeah, yeah, big time. Which is which I'm kind of excited about because I thought I knew where it was going, and now I'm just like, oh shit! All right, yeah, all right, cool. Yeah. But anything else? Anything else you vibing on? I know you were kind of like you know listening to the to the cranberries, and you were saying some like reggae and and you know the roots and that sort of thing. But yeah, you know anything? Anything? Anything else that you're kind of vibing on these days? Uh, musically, a lot of um. 
unredeemable trap music, which is <laughs> like, uh, sonically, I'm like, yeah. And then a lot of times I listen in and I'm like, ooh. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying that stuff a lot. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Mm. Like I'm, I'm like so deep in uh, deadlines that a lot of my, a lot of my like brain space has been bare instead of like enjoying stuff. But um, been reading a good book called Homegoing, which is really great. Um, read a great um, Tara Squat uh, graphic novel, Beauty. Finally got around to that, so that's really been on my mind lately. Mm-hmm. I got their new one, Satanic or Satania, but I haven't read it yet. Um, looking forward to that. You you were mentioning the trap music thing earlier, and you know I was at a, I was at an Irish pub last night, and they were playing like the traditional like Irish Celtic fair, and I was like, oh okay, I can, this is what I expect. Then like ten <laughs> o'clock hits or ten thirty hits, and all of a sudden it like switches to like house, and I'm like the f- like it's like they don't like change the lights or anything. All of a sudden I'm just sitting <laughs> and I'm just like, huh, okay, well there's like Usher and there's like <laughs> all right, well. Okay, and oh, we're going into some like pit bull, so we're going into hip hop. All right, cool. <laughs> like it was just like the weirdest, like the the weirdest shock to my system, man. Sometimes you just you're just in it, and you're just like, all right, well, I'm here now, so <laughs> let's, so let's, let's look around and see what's going on. Yeah, man. So you know, before we before we let you loose back in the in the wilds of Canada, what you know, do you have any, obviously again like Firebug out out uh, March March seventh. Do you have anything else that, you know, in the pipeline that, that you want to plug? Uh, I will soon. I've got um, a lot of really cool stuff coming this year, but nothing uh, announced yet. So the other the other ones aren't announced yet. So I'll just uh, keep it at Firebug. Okay. Well, again, March 7th. March 7th again in comic book stores everywhere and on Comixology and then on uh, out in book book stores the, uh, the following – I guess that'd be the thirteenth, if my math is correct. Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. So you know, pre-order now and, and all that good jazz. And you know, Johnny, thanks again for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. This was fun. Thanks again to Johnny for coming on. Uh, something I wish we uh, that w- we recorded that we missed the session. Um, big fan. He's a big fan of Magical Mystery Tour. Huh. Yeah. Roll up. <laughs> Uh, you, you gents get into, uh, to anything? No. Okay. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing, eh? Um, this, this past weekend, as we are recording, uh, was, was KatsuCon, which is a, uh, convention that happens here in the DC area, uh, round Valentine's Day every year. Uh, and I attended, uh, even though I'm not a huge uh, fan of anime and it is very anime centric. Uh, I do have a bunch of friends that come into town to, to go to that. And I'm like, Oh, Hey, out of town friends or friends that are usually busy, you know, during the week, you know, you're going to be there. Let me go so we can hang out. So that's what I did. Um, and, uh, and friend of the show, uh, my, uh, my host for the, uh, laser dicks show, uh, Ken was there, uh, and he actually works the show. So he was able uh, to, to help me out getting a badge. Um, and we, uh, we were, we were hanging out, we were walking through the, the, uh, the, the con, the, the, the show floor where they have all the vendors and stuff like that. And there's so many like model kits for like the, the, the giant like mech suits and, and whatnot. That's, you know, rampant in anime that I was like, man, I love modeling. I want to, Hey, there's, there's Gundam. I watched Gundam wing when it was on TV. I'm going to get me a fucking Gundam uh uh suit uh to to build and uh I really wanted to get one of the these uh perfect grade ones that are like oh, like a, like a foot tall and they have lights and moving you know ridiculous moving parts uh and unfortunately they don't have uh are they they uh, Bandai who makes the uh, the Gundam model kits never made one for Death Scythe which is my favorite of the Gundams because I've only ever seen Gundam Wing, and he's a badass with a scythe, um, <laughs> and he's got bat wings. Um, but so, or I guess Death Scythe Hell has bat wings. But uh, but yeah, so uh, they do have they they do have Wing Gundam, which is the the heroes 
uh, Gundam from that series, and I'm like, yeah, maybe I'll pick that one up. Uh, so I'm gonna when I when I when uh, in 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 a little bit when I get my tax refund back, uh, so I'll have a little bit more spending money. Uh, I think I will get the uh, the Wing Gundam, but uh, as it stands right now, I did pick up a Death Scythe um, Master Grade, mm. which is the next step down. So they're like eight inches tall ish. Uh, and they don't have the lights, but they do have a lot of art, uh, points of articulation. So I'm looking forward to building that. You, you, you should check out a uh, G Gundam if you ever get, I, we've kind of recommended it or like we've talked to guests and that's always kind of been their favorite Gundam. It's my favorite Gundam. Yeah. It's uh dome on cashew against master Asia. It's, he wants to control North, South, East, West, and center. Oh, is that is that the where that reference comes from? To become Super Asia, <laughs> yeah, uh, the, yeah. I was I was talking I was talking with Ken. He he. Uh, uh, while you know while I was doing this, he was like uh, surprised me because he is like uh, the anime master, especially uh, you know of of my my Western friends, uh, which is to say he's white. Uh, <laughs> But uh, uh, like, if I need any anything anime, I'm like, well, Ken probably knows because he's got like a doctorate in Evangelion. Uh, but but uh, so uh, I was talking with him, and he's actually honorary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not accredited. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, self proclaimed. Uh, 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 he might be wrong. Who knows? Uh, he's just watched it a lot of times. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So he. Uh, he he's actually never watched any of the Gundam series except he he's caught he's caught a couple G Gundam and he was talking about that and how uh, uh, how it's it's a more it's a little bit more fighting centric than uh, than Gundam Wing was and I was like oh man one of the things that I loved about Gundam Wing was the action in it and then I'm like looking it up because uh, I decided to start watching it again since I'm thinking about building the model um, I looked it up and like Gundam Wing was like plotted for being one of the more drama centric series that they did of, of all the Gundam shows. And I was like, Oh really? <laughs> I need to find one of these like fighting ones. And he was, and I was like, mm, I guess I'll check out G Gundam. Cause that's the one he was talking about. And I was, and in the back of my mind, I was like, I keep hearing about it. I don't remember where <laughs> clearly from this show. Mm. So once I'm done, I'm about, I'm already about like, a like a fifth of the way through the series. Uh, Cause it's been, a couple days um so i guess after i'm done with that i'll i'll check out this g gundam it's yeah. good it's it's yeah it's my favorite okay. certainly uh, i mean if you want to control north south east west and cent- c- central asia just center he just calls it center center <laughs> <laughs> all the cardinal main cardinal directions plus center yeah because he wants to he wants to control where he stands. That's what, like, and according to him, when he does that, he will go from being Master Asia to Super Asia. Mm. That's his. That's his goal in that series. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think if I did anything worthwhile. I uh, picked up some vintage comic books, which are always nice. I got a couple issues of Man Thing. Ooh. I want to become the world's mo- foremost expert on Man Thing. You probably already are. <laughs> Just, yeah. No, I kid. I I am a lover of all of the lesser known characters, but I know nothing about <laughs> Man Thing. Do you like? I know that he's very similar to Swamp Thing. Mm-hmm. Do you like Swamp Thing's design better or Man Thing's? Swamp Thing. Okay. Yeah. A little bit more personified. I like the the it's man the the, the the Swamp Thing. It's the triangle nose. Yeah. yeah. That's seriously it. That was like that's genius. Whereas it's the, it's the Alan Moore influence that I love. <laughs> it's false. Either, either <laughs> one's fair. Either yeah. one's fair. I like, well, I like that Wes Craven directed the movie. The first one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, have, have there been multiple? There's a second movie in a TV series. There's a animated series where the intro is Swamp Thing. Nah, nah, it's just really? wild thing. But I, it's thought, swamp thing. I thought that's where, as a kid, I thought that's where that came from. Yeah. That's like how I thought Lawrence of Arabia's theme was from The Spy Who Loved Me. <laughs> because they play it during the Spy Who Loved Me, and I saw that movie before Lawrence of Arabia. And I was like watching Lawrence of Arabia, and I'm like, nah, nah, nah. and I'm mm-hmm. like, this. How did this happen? Yeah, mm-hmm. this came, this out. came out like 15 years before. Yeah, 16, whatever. No, 15. You're at the first yeah. time. Yeah. No, <laughs> I wasn't. On... No, I like the uh, I like the fact that Man Thing always like has no 
He's got like a trunk mouth nose thing. Yeah. He's got like three like an things. Doesn't he have three yeah. things hanging from his face? Yeah, yeah. There's but like tusks. Yeah, I guess tendrils. And then yeah. he's got like the red eyes. And he either looks angry or like perplexed. Mm. Sometimes both. Yeah. I also have a. Well, issue. <laughs> when you wake up in the morning, you look in the mirror and you just go, "Jesus <laughs> Christ!" <laughs> You're gonna be one of the two. Yeah. There's no good hair day for man thing. It's just. Man, Man thing. thing. <laughs> <laughs> they make a passing reference to him in the season one finale of uh, Agents of Shield. Do they really? Yeah, yeah. like when um, Maria Hill's going over all these files, and she's just like, "What's Man Thing?" <laughs> nice. <laughs> and that's as much as we get. Yeah. Oh, so that's yeah. it all, really. Yeah, yeah. And damn it. What? What? So, so what is what is Man Thing? It's basically Swamp Thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's. Yeah. In fact, there was talk initially about like there being a lawsuit between DC and Marvel or some sort of legal action mm-hmm. being taken place. Um, but they were just like, it's just a weird fucking... Like, co- they like probably Superman th- and Captain Marvel? Well, you know how Fawcett Comics, the creators of Cap- publishers of Captain Marvel got destroyed. Yeah. Okay. That's why I made the... the For our listeners at yeah. home. Mm-hmm. The, sure, go right ahead. The... Um, Superman comes about. Every comic book publisher in America is like, we want our own Superman, including DC, the publishers of Superman. They're like, Bat- here's Batman. Here's, like, they basically... We want more! Yeah. Fawcett Comics creates this character, Captain Marvel. And D- it eventually it's like, it's the most popular book on the stands for a couple of years. It outsells Superman. It outsells all the other superhero books. And so DC, at that time, National Comics. But DC sells uh, or sues... Um, Fawcett Comics, and during the lawsuit, it comes out during the in the production notes for the creation of Captain Marvel. One of the editorial notes is make it more like Superman, and that's what fucking kills Fawcett Comics mm. because they it's de- it's decided the court decides it's a derivative of Superman. Um, yeah, they didn't just look at it. Just yeah, look at it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, why put that in writing? I mean, I mean, yeah. look, just just read Kingdom Come. Yeah. <laughs> In the fifties, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> one day, <laughs> Mark Wade and Alex yeah. Ross, um, yeah. So that's what that's what killed Fawcett Comics. That's why you don't. That who also had the Wizard, mm-hmm. Tom <laughs> Sizemore. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, so nothing, Jake. Nothing. Nothing this week. No. No. I didn't no. even work. I just sat in silence. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think if I did anything else. Not really. No. Okay. No. no. Okay. Well, thanks again, Johnny. Johnny Christmas for coming on the show again. Firebugs out in comic book stores everywhere on Wednesday, March seventh. Uh, you know, definitely check that out. And uh, this has been another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Jake. Thank you very much. Good night, Eric Bonner. This has been another Geek Out production. If you enjoyed what you heard, hey, you know, we've got a special episode every Friday. Of course, there's the usual catching up show every Wednesday. And you get book club episodes just about every Tuesday these days. Thanks for listening.